I'm Cleetia Grise, a professor of organic geochemistry at Curtin University in Perth in Western Australia. My background is in uh, organic and isotope geochemistry. I'm a chemist, not a geologist. And I'm going to talk about organics and uh, less about minerals, but the role of organics in mineral deposits today. Um, I have a history of working on mass extinctions, so I'll, um, some of that work is very relevant to the deposition of various mineral deposits. So I'm going to present two case studies. Now, just to start with an introduction about the deposition of organic matter. Um, organic matter deriving through erosion from land material. Um, and this can get deposited by river runoff into a marine realm, for example. And those uh, nutrients uh, lead to algal blooms. Um, the algal blooms then uh, lead to anoxic conditions because the supply of organic matter to the aquatic realm um, supersedes the amount of oxygen which is required to oxidise the organic matter. So some of it becomes preserved and deposited, sedimented with minerals of a geological time frames, and um, therefore where we get sediments. And the organic geochemistry actually collect rocks, um, uh, mainly core samples. Uh, these rocks are generally sedimentary, although we have worked on uh, metamorphic type rocks as well. These rocks are ground and extracted with common organic solvents like dichloromethane and methanol. And we obtain an extract which looks very much like an oil. Within this extract, we can separate thousands of different organic molecules which derive from natural product precursors. These are eluted by methods of liquid chromatography to get saturate, aromatic and polar components. And these are then identified by special mass spec techniques to see which components are present in these fractions. Further, we can measure their individual stable carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopic ratios at natural abundance levels of each compound within these mixtures. So this is what a, a geologist probably looks at is a fossil skeleton. A geochemist looks at a molecular fossil. Here we have a precursor, which is uh, called a hopanol. This precursor um, comes from largely bacteria and when this organism died and this material became deposited and sedimented in the subsurface, it lost these functional groups to produce what is called a molecular fossil, bearing a very similar structure to the biochemical here. So this is what is called a biomarker, and that's what an organic geochemist tends to look for in these rocks. Um, biomarker geochemistry was traditionally used in petroleum exploration, um, but more recently, uh, or in the last, uh, I guess, 15 years or so, there's been a very gradual growing interest in the role of organic geochemistry in mineral deposits. In regards to petroleum formation, we have life here, and uh, the uh, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, etc., through the early stages of diagenesis, uh, give rise to a very complex macromolecule called kerogen, which is very insoluble in common organic solvents, and a bitumen type material, which is a smaller part of the rock. This kerogen is the precursor for oil and gas. Um, with increasing temperature, and um, we get oil and gas uh, in catagenesis stage. In metagenesis, at much higher temperatures in the order of 200 degrees C, we might get pyrobitumin and gas, and very extreme temperatures, we get graphite. So the type of kerogen, depend, it depends on the type of organic matter that contributed to it, type three, Kerogen is largely derived from land plant material containing spores and pollen. Type 2 kerogen, very hydrocarbon rich, is um, largely from algae. And these are gas-prone and oil-prone type materials. 
Now moving to isotopic composition. For those who are not familiar with stable isotopes, I'll just introduce a definition in PEMIL, which is the ratio of heavy to light isotope ratios of carbon-13, carbon-12, relative to a standard multiplied by 1,000 per mil, thousand to give per mil. That's because carbon-12 is only a, is 99% or so of the carbon pool, and carbon-13 is only about 1%. And nature alters that ratio relative to an arbitrary standard and international standard. So this is our international standard. We have a negative scale. We have CO2 in the atmosphere today, which is minus 8 per mil. That means it's got more carbon-12 than the arbitrary standard. Discrimination against carbon-13, because carbon-12 is more reactive and favoured in chemical reactions. The CO2 in the atmosphere has shifted from negative 8, from, from, from negative 6 to negative 8 per mil in the last um, 200 years um, due to the Industrial Revolution and the burning of fossil fuels. Um, algae, photosynthetic, um, span this sort of range. These are based on bulk compositions, by the way. These are temperate plants using a, a common mode of photosynthesis called a C3 pathway. And then we have uh, some Pilbara spinifex grass from Western Australia, a very hot environment, and they use a, a C4 pathway of photosynthesis. So you see there's a negative um, delta 13C of these components through photosynthesis and biochemical pathways. Green sulfur bacteria, um, these are very unusual organisms that are referred to use a special cycle to capture CO2 and are very um, less negative in carbon-13 compared to, for example, phytoplankton. And oil, which comes from largely algae and plants, uh, spans a large range. And bacterial methane, or methane, which comes from cows, or natural gas, or coal, um, is the most depleted source of carbon on our planet. And purple sulfur bacteria use a similar pathway to normal algae. So where do these green sulfur bacteria live? They live in the present day Black Sea. Um, these are chlor called chlorobii. The present day Black Sea is characterized by a very stratified water column. So the ocean is stratified in that uh, the bottom waters are completely anoxic and the upper waters are oxic. This um, is because there's been a significant nutrient input and we have algal bloom in the upper water column. We have a decrease in oxygen and we have an increase in hydrogen sulfide at a chemistry, what we call a chemocline, a chemistry climb. The uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, is produced by the organic matter which has been deposited with our minerals by sulfate reducers in the sediment sod near the sediment water interface and that produce hydrogen sulfide. That hydrogen sulfide, as you can see here, is used by these organisms, green sulfur bacteria, as opposed to utilising water as an electron donor in photosynthesis. They carry out photosynthesis by capturing light, longer wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, by utilising bacterial chlorophylls and carotenoids, as opposed to chlorophyll, which is um, the main pigment in cyanobacteria to carry out photosynthesis. These conditions have been reported previously um, in the Zestein Sea. Though it was mentioned earlier about the Kufferschiefer, the copper shell in Germany. The oceans at this time were very eusinic, that is photic on eusinic, hydrogen sulfide and light in the upper part of the water column, based on the presence of biomarkers. I'll come to those types of biomarkers in a moment. Further, um, the 1.6 billion year old lead zinc silver deposit of Australia was deposited under these conditions as well. And these conditions are associated with three of the five major mass extinction events of our planet. So what are the biomarkers of these? We know now what a biomarker is. It resembles 
the um, natural product here we have biomarkers for chlorobii, isorina retain, which has just altered from the pigment by hydrogenation of these double bonds. We can also have um, malamides, which uh, break down products of bacterial chlorophylls made by the chlorobii. These have a different structure to chlorophyll A, um, particularly this B ring here has this extended alkylation. The magnesium, depending on the redox conditions, can be replaced um, in the sedimentary subsurface by, or in the water column by vanadium, copper, iron and zinc. Further, we've, we've been, um, as part of a, a large program, have been identifying other types of porphyrins, um, which also contain gold and um, various other metal components, which may be a transport for metal um, in these ancient uh, mineral deposits. So now moving to some examples of where we use organic geochemistry. This uh, comes from a, a, a large um, international program which has been running for three years called Minerals Down Under, a flagship organic geochemistry of mineral systems for the uh, first time. The first study is um, the effect of radiolysis on biopolymers in a uranium deposit called Morga Rock. This was work carried out by uh, Caroline Jarella and co-workers. So where is the um, Morga Rock formation? This is Australia. Perth is around here. This is near where I live. Kalgoorlie to the east is uh, famous for gold. In, West, in Western Australia, and it's also famous for uranium. The gun barrel basin is here uh, to the northeast of Kalgoorlie, and the Mulga rock is, consists of three deposits called Emperor Shogun and Ambassador in the Nanu basin, which is a smaller part of the gun barrel basin. These were fluvial channels, and the stratigraphy of this Mulga rock. This Mulga rock was deposited in the, in the mid Miocene in the Nuran Basin and consists of a series of very immature sedimentary uh, sequences of sandstones, lignites, and claystones. So, the objective of um, this case study is to, to recognize molecular fossils identifying the relationships between these molecular fossils and uranium accumulation and to detect effects on molecular marker composition. So going to the Ambassador Prospect Drill Core, which is Core 566, we have um, radiometric logging and we have the Naroon Basin and the Upper Gun Barrel. There's a kaolinite layer here, which is oxidized and in the reduced fasces or intermediate fasces, we have um, samples, uh, six samples here, which have uh, the concentration of uranium. MR49 um, has the highest concentration of uranium of 5,280 ppm, and the MR54 has 173. PPM. So these have been formed in a highly reduced fluvial channel. So we subjected these samples as I showed at the beginning. We ground them, extracted the bitumen, and obtained different fractions, aliphatic, aromatic, and polars, characterized by this by tandem mass spectrometry techniques, and did delta 13C analysis of each individual molecule within these fractions. Today I'll only show you some of the data from the aliphatic fractions in terms of carbon isotopes. The polar fractions were separated into ketones, acids and alcohols and characterized by mass spectrometry. So um, to determine, we know now I mentioned what kerogen was, we had type 2 and type 3 at the beginning, type 2 being more um, uh, algal rich and type 3 being more uh, plant rich with lots of spores and pollen. Hydrogen indices here um, gives um, essentially an indication of how hydrocarbon rich a rock is 
and this oxygen indices is how oxygen rich an indices is. So we see a very nice correlation for these deposits um, with uranium concentrations less than 2000 ppm. However, the one sample with a very high uranium concentration falls off this line and it's because it has um, seems to be that the organic matter has been altered due to the presence of uranium. Effect of radiation has been shown previously by other workers um, showing a decrease in hydrocarbon content or dehydrogenation occurring um, due to the effect of uh, radiolytic minerals. So uh, we uh, suggest that the type of kerogen, um, the kerogen being macromolecular, has been affected by radiolysis and uh, has broken down through uh, hydrogen abstraction or CHC scission. The total sulfur content and uranium concentration also correlate with, for these samples um, and are consistent with most of the samples for depositional ranging from a lakey, deltaic, swampy, wetland environment, whereas MR49 again falls outside that plot, showing that there has been some alteration of that sample. The um, electron microscopy of such samples has been done previously by Energy Minerals Australia, and it's been shown that uranium enrichment is uh, associated with various types of class like pollen, um, spores here, and some woody material here showing very high uranium concentrations. So the, the Mulga rock um, is a rare, occurs, rare occurrence of discrete minerals or crystal faces hosting uranium as uranorite and coffinite. So what do these samples look like in terms of uranium concentration? Here are some halophatic hydrocarbon fractions, uh, simple traces. These are just um, anarchens. This is the carbon number here, 31, 27, for these different samples. And then we look at the change in the distribution of these hydrocarbons. And MR49 with the high uranium concentration shows a very different molecular profile to the other um, lower concentration samples. For those who are geochemists or um, are chemists in the audience, these odd even carbon preference high molecular weight NLKs, if you take a, a leaf from a tree and put it in DCM, you would obtain uh, an odd even carbon preference from the waxes of plants. So this is a lamp plant contribution you can see that as the uranium concentration increases, this profile changes dramatically, and we see a much uh, less odd even preference in this range and a much higher predominance of lower carbon chain alkanes in this um, MR49 sample. The delta 13C of, of um, the average of these individual molecules are shown here. Um, minus 29 of average, and then MR49 is somewhat um, enriched a little bit by about 2 per mil. These are indicative of lamp plant waxes and concordant with the C3 pathway, which I mentioned at the beginning of photosynthesis. And we have some alteration here of the MR49 sample. The low molecular weight compounds are very similar in all cases except for MR49. Um, so we have some links between uranium and organic matter here. We have uh, a change in the distribution of uh, NLKs to this very flat sort of profile and a shift in the isotopic composition of these individual NLKs. We have evidence from uh, the microscopy 
that uranium is high associated with spores, pollen and wood. And this is consistent with a type 2 or type 3 aliphatic biopolymer, spores and pollen, containing uh, things like sporopollen. Uh, in. Um, they also have uh, aliphatic biopolymers in algal, fungal and bacterial cysts. So we have a high aliphatic biopolymer associated with uranium, and this may provide a chemical trap for uranium. So the mechanism, given that these samples um, are actually haven't been subjected to very high temperatures, thermal cracking is unlikely. Um, there is no evidence of any microbial reworking of these samples. Uh, no degradation of these samples, and they were, we're hypothesizing that radiolytic cracking has accounted for these changes in this distribution. So the radiolytic cracking would give rise to these low-chain enolkanes, and further evidence comes from a, a series of compounds called alkanons, these, um, without going into too much detail, um, are ketones. These are from summed mass fragmentograms. And we find a whole suite of alkanone distributions which have never been reported in naturally occurring um, organisms. It's known that alkanones are made by various marine organisms called haptophytes and various plants, but not with this carbon number range of 15 to 30. If we look more closely, there are different isomers of these ketones, and these ketones um, show a shift in isomerization with uranium concentration. The two um, ketone uh, is much higher uh, where uranium is present and is, is also um, high where sulfur is present whereas the samples with lower abundances of uranium have lower abundances of these two isomers, particularly the two alkanon. So this is showing you that um, correlation nicely with the concentration of these two alkanons versus total sulfur. This is a reductant, and therefore we see the high two alkanons and the high uranium in this sample. So radiolytic alkanon formation can be explained from these biopolymers, um, where the biopolymer just breaks down through radiolysis, radiolytic cracking, to produce alkenes. Those alkenes can produce alkanons. You can have isomerization with lower pH and clay catalysis to give alkenes. You can have hydrogenation occurring. And then you can have interaction with water, with radiolysis, to form these uh, long-chain alkanons, uh, particularly in the two position. And hydration gives you an alkanols. So we have evidence for all this in these samples, um, which indicates that uranium has had an effect on the organic matter in this um, Mulga rock paleo channel. So our conclusion for this first part is that radioactive cracking of aliphatic biopolymers in ambassador deposits has occurred. Pollen and spores of plants are highly aliphatic, um, naturally occurring polymers and are recalcitrant and have a close spatial relationship with uranium, perhaps serving as a chemical trap. Further work is undergoing to see whether that is a uranium-4 or a uranium-6. Radiolysis and the cascade of secondary and tertiary reactions produce radicals, uh, carbon annihilation, to produce these suites of unusual alkenons. Low pH and high sulfur to prevent alkene isomerization, and therefore these alkatunones become the predominant isomers in the samples with high uranium and sulfur contents. This is the first identification of radiolytic molecular markers or biomarkers, which has applications to mineral exploration um, in the sense that the breakdown products of these alkenones 
um, in groundwater, for example, may give rise to gas. And uh, through uh, detection of those unusual components of the gas species from breakdown of such components, we may be able to track uranium in groundwater. Also, uh, radiolytic markers may be associated with petroleum products and has environmental applications in tracking radiolysis in other organic matter types. The second example um, also comes from Australia. Uh, this is from a paleoproterozoic, here's your chance, lead zinc silver deposit. Here's your chance was from the uh, discovery, discoverer of this lead zinc, do, lead zinc silver deposit um, because uh, he said, here's your chance to make a million bucks. And uh, that's how it's got its name from the discoverer. And we've used novel organic and inorganic geochemical techniques to characterize this deposit. So here's your chance, HYC. It's hosted in the Barney Creek Formation. This is um, in the North Northern Territory of Australia. The HYC is um, hosts 1.64 billion year old um, lead zinc deposits. It's part of the Proterozoic Mount Isa and MacArthur lead zinc provenance. And it's one of the largest sediment-hosted lead zinc silver deposits. The formation of the HYC, this is the current model, is that we have what is a Barney Creek formation of sediment here. We have um, clastics, upper Tuluru group, which contain volcanics. And we have a low, lower Wollongong formation, a shale dolomite. The lower Tolora group as well, and we have the EMU fault zone. Two models have been proposed. The first one is post depositional um, formation of lead zinc um, sulfides. That is, that the brines um, moved up the EMU fault zone and passed through the Bani Creek formation and precipitated out the sulfide minerals. The second model is related to the, the um, slide I showed you of the Black Sea, where we had evidence, where we have evidence of molecular markers of organisms using hydrogen sulfide in photosynthesis, and the uh, the uh, um, brines and the interaction of um, this deposit um, could have led to also the. Uh, lead zinc sulfides. So the formation of HYC, there's some uh, unanswered questions. We know there's redox conditions of the Marcatha Basin. Recent evidence suggests it's a ferruginous basin, iron too rich. There's also a possibility of it being a microbial ecosystem of the basin. Um, previous studies have um, hindered by alteration of overprinting and this possible influence on redox conditions. So um, we've looked at the uh, Barney Creek formation and the uh, HYC deposit and five samples have been taken along the estimated flow paths of the mineralisation fluid going from hot to cold uh, mineralisation fluids and applied organic geochemical techniques. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the samples are extracted to obtain what is called bitumen and the kerogen is left behind. That's the insoluble uh, part of the organic matter. In fact, if you take the kerogen and the rock residue and remove the heavy minerals by HF digestion, you actually get the second bitumen fraction which is entrapped within the minerals and is believed to be shielding or over printing um, the bitumen one. So this has been looked at in some detail. This is previous work reported in as um, planetary sciences showing the bitumen one which is uh, 
very uh, 14 to 32 enalkanes, uh, quite nothing special about that distribution um, for this region. However, the bitumen 2, which is entrapped within the heavy minerals, shows a completely different profile with um, even odd alkanes extending out to 38. This suggests um, these alkanes have been previously um, identified in uh, 400 million year old concretions, which have sulfur oxidizing and sulfate reducing bacteria. And this is what we attribute these um, components to here. Uh, the bitumen 2, in terms of uh, bitumen 2 is in blue here. This is delta 13C, distance from the pit, coming from low to high temperature. And bitumen 1 up here. These have quite different delta 13C compositions on average. We also see that the kerogen um, is here, and it's uh, possible, given that the offset of this bitumen 1 um, is somewhat uh, too large for a neoproterozoic kerogen, that the bitumen 2 um, appears indigenous to the HYC. I won't go into the details of why that offset, offset occurs, but... Um, in the literature, it's known that this offset is consistent, whereas this offset here is too large. So this is evidence of a bacterial sulfate reducing and sulfur oxidizing source, and the HYC was deposited in eugenic conditions. You can look further at sulfur, delta 34S, like you can delta 13C of carbon. Um, sulfur source from seawater, sulfate or evaporitic deposits. And sulfate can, be, sulfate can be reduced to sulfide by these bacteria, leading to a significant depletion in delta in 34S. Sulfur reacts with metal ions to precipitate sulfide minerals, and also, there's almost no fractionation or no significant change in that. Sulfide can also be oxidised to elemental sulfur, and polysulfides react um, with a slight enrichment in 34S. Polysulfides can also incorporate um, functionalised organic matter during early stages of diagenesis, and sulphur also can be incorporated um, by synthetic sulphur. Living cells um, can incorporate that too. So these are some of the delta 34S results. Um, this is the HYC kerogen, the bulk of the organic matter. This is elemental sulphur. HYC pyrite, sulfur, galena, cephalorite, and the Barney Creek pyrite. And um, it appears that the organic um, sulfur pool, uh, without going into all the details, is in fact bacterially derived uh, sulfur. Um, uh, and this um, then leads to your metal sulfides. So, um, in conclusion, uh, there's uh, external sources of sulphate derived from the MacArthur Basin, possibly carried with mineralizing fluid. The sulphate entered to the HY subbasin and was reduced to sulphide by sulphate reducing bacteria, and eugenic conditions were created in the subbasin which kind of points to the Model B, which I gave earlier. So I'd like to finish there. Um, and to thank uh, Steve Mako and our colleagues and the organisers to invite me to this gift workshop. I thank you for your attention and I hope I've given you a little bit of a flavour of what an organic geochemist does in Australia and what sorts of deposits we're working on. But this is just a, a, a very brief summary of two of many deposits where organic geochemistry is, is playing a major role in the formation of mineral deposits from not just um, source and deposition, but um, transport. And also we're looking at thermodynamics and kinetic modeling. Okay, thank you.